Well, first of all, I'd like to thank you a lot for being here, and uh, it's pretty amazing. I'm just starting my PhD, so I'm really honored being here, and uh, I've heard a lot of uh, interesting talks by people. I've I've had their books in my shelves, you know, and uh, it's uh, really nice being here. And secondly, I just would like to warn you that I'm uh, just a freshly newly father again, so I've not slept. I'm full of love and harmonies, and I hope I won't get too emotional. All right. <laughs> So the web and ubiquitous solution for real-time music and teaching, it's a question I had to ask. It's going to be a high-level talk just about general ideas and what things could be um, made for... Um, I will focus on non-academic music. I will try to make distinctions between academic and non-academic music. Or, well, at least not make distinctions between that. And then talk about non-academic learning, how people uh, learn by themselves, and about music applications on the web and what it could imply. So just about academic and uh, non-academic music, uh, well, it's quite of difficult to find terms about that. We can hear about serious music, about, uh, but why so serious? <laughs> we can hear about popular music, but uh, underground uh, music are not that popular, and it's uh, in popular music too. And well, and yet you've got that academic, non-academic music uh, that distinction that as it was kind of easy to make the distinction in the 18th century because you had that oral and written tradition. But I think right now it's not that obvious, and things have changed a lot. Uh, of course, in the 18th century, uh, you were the, the aristocracy, the oligarchy wanted to have control of the culture, and we could talk about witch hunting and many things, but in music there were that clear distinctions being made. In the 19th century, it's beginning to change a little bit um, with um, the cultural market is becoming too calm, and you, you, we can sometimes hear uh, about soft music. Uh, but what is interesting is about the 20th century, uh, there's been huge technical evolutions in the 20th century that really have changed the shape of uh, the landscape of uh, music creation. Of course, it happened before, but at a slower rate. And so in the 20th century, we could not uh, start without talking about Charles Cross. I'm not sure you know about him, but Thomas Edison. Charles Cross is said to be uh, one of... Uh, maybe the first to, to invent it. Uh, actually, he seems to have uh, been able to record things, but not able to play them back. And uh, the same year, in the 1877, if I remember it well, and it was Thomas Edison that made the phonograph. And well, uh, we all know what happened next. And uh, like Gutenberg uh, um, helped uh, music sheets to spread and to, to be able to be played by a lot of people, uh, music on a, on, on something to be heard uh, really uh, influenced a lot of musicians, jazz musicians heard, uh, played a lot and learned a lot by hearing music and uh, you don't have to ask uh, an orchestra you know, to come to your room and play 100 signs something to just learn it you have something that you can hear and hear and hear again and more than that of course it was used as then a musical tool so we've heard a lot of things about Pierre, uh, Pierre Schaeffer, that started a lot of things with that. And, uh, but it's not only in the academic background. Um, we have to, let, to, to wait a little bit, but we could talk about the Beatles, for example, that did a lot of things in the 60s, early 60s, late 50s, indeed. Uh, and they, they tried to, to play with those things too in a, in a different um, popular way um, with those tools. And we can talk, we could talk about John Cage, about many people, but well, we can see that things are becoming to, to, to be used in, in, in different category of, of, uh, of people. And those tools were added with synthesizers. We could record music, but we could create uh, music uh, from nothing, from the ground, from electronic. And uh, of course, uh, you have an. Uh, RCA Mark II on your left, which was pretty huge, expensive, and it was one of the first synthesizers that, that have been used. And, well, it's not obvious, I think, to you how to use them. You have to patch, you have to, try to test many things. And uh, so it was more reserved to the academic uh, background. Why? Because there, it was institutionals, all right? They had the money, they had the time to make researches and so on. And um, the non-academic background has just had to wait to something on the market. So here you have an example of the Mog Minimog, Minimog 
sorry, we used to say moog in France, I know it's really bad. <laughs> so I try to stick to the mog thing, <laughs> but it's weird for us to say that. So the mog um, that has been used, for example, and well, we could talk about Kraftwerk that did a lot with a crowd rock background and uh, electropop that influenced a lot of musicians. And it's interesting to say that Kraftwerk come from an academic background. They all went to the conservatoire, all right. And they are used to those um, way of thinking, uh, to those skills, to those knowledge. And that is interesting how they uh, thought their music. It was really uh, doing things in with really few few things, few materials, and even uh, synthesis where it was really soft. They don't want it to have uh, big spectral things. It was really uh, tiny things and robotic things, and uh, it influenced uh, people a lot. Uh, and, and not directly, uh, but indirectly, that led some people from then, uh, um, all the music that came later, to maybe um, being used to those more academic background of uh, Schiffer and so on that used those um, synthesizers. And uh, one thing that is also interesting to note is that uh, we're far from, um, Luigi Russolo said that um, the orchestra, it was some anemia about music. You had, you had no, no sound, it was not interesting. It was the art of sound, that he, of noise that he wanted to, 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 to use. And uh, Kraftwerk, which influenced then uh, some noise music, etc. Uh, where on the contrary, trying to put new anemia, new trying to have a few spectral things to to work with. And what is interesting is that um, that I think it's really relevant to talk about that because we we had a talk with um, Marco Stropa uh, that was really interesting uh, earlier. And I think that sometimes we have tools that sound really cheap and are not interesting at all. And I think you all heard about uh, those things, the TB, TR808 and TB303 uh, that were made by Roland and that was just a bleak flow for them. It was not working at all in the market. They did not sold it. They thought that all the guitarists would buy, would buy that and just work with that to improvise, but it did not work. So they ditched everything, all right? But it was interesting for people in the street to just get that and say, okay, we can start to do some music with that. And then it became an interesting sound because everybody was working with that. And nowadays it's just expensive. You, can, you just, just can get one like that, all right? So tools, maybe some cheap, but it's the way we use it, I think, is that we can make music. And that's why I'm really interested uh, in uh, popular music, I think, to uh, make their, their own music with things we think we, we are developing because we are a little bit with everyone here with an academic background. It's, it's easier for us to have the knowledge, maybe um, the skills to use them. And popular music always um, putting things in a way we, we, we do not have thought, all right? So it's interesting to, to know that. So we are in that kind of Apollo music versus Dionysus dichotomy, you know, and uh, like the art in the academic way that is beautiful, that is well made, that is a uh, uh, thought at the beginning and uh, really with skilled people. And then you have got that more dirty, um, popular background. Dirty in a good way sometimes, but well, he, he, we could talk, of course, I, I've not talked about that, but I think the 70s is really interesting with the punk uh, background that said to anyone, uh, you can make music if you, if you don't uh, play an instrument. And at least if you don't play, even that's better, right? <laughs> because you can really play with your emotions. And in jazz, we had Hornet Coleman that did the same thing. He said, I'm fed up with uh, bebop, with hard bop. It's going too fast. We're going too far. In. We are playing with our heads. So he started to use instruments he had never used before and wanted to make music with that. And then, of course, peer-to-peer -peer changed... Uh, music, uh, the music industry uh, does not agree at all with that, but it's really an interesting part in, in our history. And I think we were able to listen to so many types of music, to share music and uh, to, uh, I think, contribute to the market uh, because we bought several things since we used, we were used to listen to different things too, and we wanted to buy them, etc., etc. So the peer-to-peer -peer change uh, our landscape, and we were used to listen to academic, non-academic, to use music in uh, 
in a way uh, like the, we are not really listening to it, sometimes we are really listening to it. And so I think now the, there's no real frontier between academic, non-academic, it is kind of blurred. Of course, it requires different skills, different ways of writing music. Um, but I think it's interesting to know that there are some advances that are made in the academic, um, of course, that we are, that is not accessible right now to popular music, but I think that is what would be interesting. So I would talk about non-academic learning, and I've called, quoted Archie Wells, I think it's interesting here, saying civilization is a race between education and catastrophe. And I think we have to remember it's a serious subject, really, really, really. We sometimes say that, well, education, we know that it's, it means something, but I think we've forgotten in our uh, culture that well, it's always survival and uh, not everything is that easy in life and education is always to ask ourselves what are we doing and what how we could have um, really um, gather people in the same opinions not in the same opinions but try to achieve things together <laughs> and uh, I think it's interesting to put, um, like um, Jason Freeman said, the A in STEAM, in the STEM learning, all right, putting really arts at school is really something that is relevant. You know, we could talk about Ken Robinson, so working a lot about that, and well, I think it's pretty obvious we miss that, and all that we've said uh, in the past hours is uh, going in this direction. So, I want to just to tell a few things before. Uh, for those who doesn't know him, it's John Holt. Of course, John Holt did not play Minecraft. <laughs> it was dead before, but I think there's something that is really interesting about what he taught. If you don't know him, uh, he worked a lot about de-schooling, actually. Saying that the school system is broken. Of course, it's very fashionable nowadays to talk about that, but it was in the 70s. And he wanted to, 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 to see things differently. And he said that um, you could learn by your own mostly, and he was really interested by uh, um, looking at, at children, very, very young children, and how they, 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 they shape their world, all right? And he was with a, a little girl, she was two, year, two years old, and they were walking, and in a field they saw a cow, all right? And she was used to that, say, oh, cow, moo, all right? Fine, you can find a cow, and they, they joked with that, there was no problem. Then he was going to his sister's, another field, and there is a ship. And what the girl says, cow. And here, John Holt stops. And he said, I could have said, no, honey, it's not a cow. You know, it's a ship, ship. And he said, no, I don't have to interfere. Can you imagine, uh, uh, we, they said at that moment that children were not, were not capable of uh, abstract thinking. And he said, this girl has made such a huge abstraction saying that an animal chewing grass in the field is a cow. She could recognize them, all right? She's two years old, she can do lambda calculus, for example. <laughs> That's abstract thinking right from the start. And if we interfere, it's really hard to, to teach those children to say, you, you can't think on your own, don't make your own abstractions. I'm going far ahead of, of you and I'm saying, no, don't make these abstractions, I'm going in more details. And I think that's one of the problems we could have in music, that it's going so fast, technology is going pretty fast. And if you start uh, a course with uh, beginners and saying, trying to, to speak about, uh, I don't know, um, physical modeling or uh, a dynamic compressor, uh, et cetera, et cetera, they, they won't get it because they have not made the first abstractions, the first abstract thinking, uh, just in general ideas, just by experimenting. And that's what is missing, I think, in the way we, we um, non-academic music is taught sometimes for beginners. There's a lot of new ways, and uh, we, we talk about la minute uh, electroacoustics, several things that are really interesting, I think, in this way. But, well, uh, at least it's just a point of view. We could talk about, uh, you know, uh, Pierre Boulet saying to Pierre Schiffer that it was just uh, some empirical shoddy workmanship, what he was doing. and. Sometimes people think that uh, uh, popular culture is just empirical and, and shoddy workmanship, but it's not. Of course, it's empirical, but it's a way of making music differently. And the problem is, well, I think nobody in this room have, has never played uh, the snake, right? But if I give you one, well, you pretty soon get a, get a hunch that maybe you have to blow inside of it to play with the holes. Maybe 
if you want to do some percussion, to try things, uh, to do electroacoustic or whatever you want with it, you get some sounds. You'll be musical right from the start, all right? And then synthesizers, well, I'm not really kind. Uh, it's a modular one, so it, of course you won't get any sound pretty quick, but I think it's beginning to be a little bit harder, but you tr could try to experiment too, to tweak, tweak, some, tweak some knobs and to, to try to play with the keyboard. You could get a sound. And then you have a computer. And the problem is that you can put a computer to anyone like that and say, go on, play music. It's not working at all. There, there is a, such a gap that it's not that easy. It's a general tool, and we are hacking it to make music. And I think it's interesting now to think how to make new interfaces, new, new ways of, of uh, programming. That's all we've talked about, of course, and to be more accessible. And uh, I remember just uh, um, a thing when I was at uh, chalon sur saône Conservatoire. Um, there were uh, young children, he was 13 years old, and he was trying to um, take lessons in uh, what we call music actuelle. It's kind of a bunch of non-academic popular music. I could not say non-academic, it's at the conservatoire now, so I don't know how to talk about that, but well, he came, he was a, a violinist player, and uh, uh, we were improvising, but not improvising in the way you say, all right, A minor, we make a blues, everyone's comfortable, we can do things. No, it's really to put yourself in danger. I'll, I'll always ask yourself questions, who you are, how can you make music together without preparing things, and so on. And Franco C. Chardonnay, the teacher, gave him a guitar and said, all right, everyone, we go, we play. And we could see that 13 years old boy be, beginning to become white and say, I'm sorry, I've never played guitar. I can't play guitar. And then the teacher said, good for you. Let's go. Lights off and it's gone. And it was amazing to see just that children completely lost. And Jenny tried to play with his ears, just plucking the guitars and then gaining some sound and then detuning it and saying, wow, there's an amplifier, right? I'm going to make some noise, etc., etc." And things began really to, to, to take shape. And we played with him with different ages, different uh, cultural backgrounds. And it, it really meant something at that moment, all right? And now people are, uh, in the non-academic music, uh, I think things are beginning to be, there are not all used to, but uh, the digital audio workstation are beginning, beginning to be kind of a standard for some people no, uh, which uh, are in uh, uh, popular music, I would say. Uh, maybe they are not used to it very much. They, maybe they don't put things in auxiliary tracks and they really have uh, <laughs> CPU problems having thousands of reverbs on, reverbs on different tracks, etc., etc. But they kind of understand a little bit about routing, signal, about putting effects and insert, sometimes auxiliary, sometimes trying to mix and to produce sound. We talk a lot about prosumers now, consumer about music, producer about music, and I think it's a little bit mixed today. But the question I wanted to ask is what about live for those, those people? And there's lots of live music of those cultural background, well, they just stroke space bar, or sometimes they have some interactions just with live, for example, playing some samples, or sometimes uh, playing with some knobs with uh, the use of synthesizers. They have used hardware synthesizers, so maybe you ha will have some play with a low-pass filter, but it's really at a few, few things that are used. It's mostly a produced music that I want to put everyone to listen in a, in a live situation and just trying to add some movements, but it's not even thought as live music from the start. Sometimes a lot of people are very embarrassed to play that thing because they've record, recorded uh, 20 guitars, they've, thought, they've uh, sang uh, for 20 tracks, etc. Et in live, they are along with their computer. I don't know how to uh, reproduce that in live and to have a live interaction with people. <coughs> and of course, when we go directly from a digital audio workstation uh, to a patching uh, universe, uh, I think it's kind of tricky to, 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 to get from one to the other there. Once again, uh, I think the technical gap is pretty big uh, to abstract, to make their own abstractions and to experiment. And I think that they, they learn a lot, we learn a lot by experimenting, all right? And that's where uh, native apps, I think, um, it, in general use, uh, there are some limits. Uh, it requires those knowledge, skills we've talked about, and interest in computers, and some people are not interested at all by the computers. They just want to make music. They know that it's a good way to make it, but 
well, you have to understand to compile things sometimes to, well, we, we've talked about that. Uh, quickly, of course, we could talk about quickly perishable closed source softwares. When you had an instrument in the beginning, well, it could last, at least we still have cellos, we have several instruments we could play. But now it's really uh, interesting. I heard, for example, Mila Puckett uh, talking about Max for Live, meaning it's a pretty good tool. A lot of people are using it, but we all know Max, for example, you make a, a patch, you just cross your fingers next year, will it work or not? The graphical user interface has changed. As, will it work? Uh, maybe it, took, it will take more CPU and I was just borderline <laughs> with my previous patch and I don't know what is happening. And then Ableton Live is going on in its own way too. So if you make something with Max for Live, how long will it last? I mean, if you can only tour for six months, seven months, and then you have to make updates, you rethink your code and everything is broken, it's kind of difficult to approach that. And one last thing, um, that's really subjective thought. Again, uh, it's, I think we have some generational, it's really generational, uh, things could change, but we have some schooling artifacts, uh, meaning that um, things were approached, like I've talked about John Holt saying, we always try to, uh, with a good thought, a good thought, a good feeling, we try to teach people to say, there's a lot of things in this world, we are passionate, we want to go so fast and to, Always take to, we have to go to, to courses, to different places, to schools to learn things. Don't do things on your own, all right? It's, you, you'll go too slow, you're, you'll not, you're not skilled enough, you don't have the knowledge. And it's difficult to think like that. And then to, to come to, um, uh, Marco Stropa to, told us that in school, he, he searches uh, people in, where he's teaching. Um, with who are individuals who want to express themselves, all right? And they come back from a schooling underground where you don't have to be an individual at all. You have to be formatted uh, to the PISA standards, the standard assessment. You have, uh, you don't have, well, collaborative is coming now to school. Thank you. Before it was calling cheating. <laughs> that was really weird. And, well, things are going, are beginning to change, of course, but I think there are a few generation, generations that it's not easy for them just to go by their own, to open manuals, to try to think by themselves and just try to experiment. If, if you don't have the tools, we kind of feel lost and not comfortable saying, I'm sorry, I don't do that. All right. And uh, I think it's interesting to, to quote Carol, Carol Dweck. I don't know if you know, she's a researcher. Uh, uh, I think she's at Stanford and uh, she, she, she talked about mindset, about fixed and growth mindset. Of course, we all think it's, it would be interesting to have a growth mindset and we all think we have a growth mindset, but I think most of us, we have several ways in, in fixed mindset. You know, like everything is just in yourself. It's uh, you born like that. You're not good at mathematics. Well, that's all right. Your mother was not good at mathematics, all right? You're born like that. You can do anything. And it's really hard then to go in a learning environment where we ask individuals to be themselves, to be creative when we have that background. All right, I'm going too far. <laughs> so music on the web, uh, I think then uh, maybe it could be uh, a link to maybe try to think about ways to uh, avoid that huge gap. All right, I'm gonna go pretty fast. Uh, well. So webs, you know how it works uh, from static pages to web-like uh, pages. About education, music education, well, um, Jason Freeman talked about Coursera too. Uh, we can see Angie, Andrew, and Daphne Kohler with uh, the Coursera platform, for one of the biggest uh, MOOC platform. You have lots of them. Uh, but here it's interesting to say Daphne Kohler wanted to, to, to make education in another way, thinking that instead of spending 80% of your time at school learning new materials and then going back at home, and if you still have some energy to pay, spending 20% of your time experimenting, why not doing uh, uh, the contrary, spending just 20% of your time at home with learning new materials and then going to school to experiment with professionals. That's why, why uh, Coursera was made. And I think MOOC is really interesting in the collaborative way, etc. But here you see it's just not about music, about web applications, etc. It's just learning in a collaborative way. Uh, you've got Melidia too. Um, I always forgot his name. So Bastien Sanac and Vincent Chantrier made, I think, a pretty good interface. And it's like a video game. You're not playing really real time. It's just samples. But it's ear training. And it's new ways of learning music that is far from... Uh, learning pitches, it, 
you do indeed, and the more advances you go, uh, the more you advance, and the more the more difficult it is. But I think th there are good solutions. But what is good now is Web Audio API. What he did, right? Uh, we could live live music on the web. So I'm gonna go faster than that. But first, things with native nodes were made uh, where digital your workstation and synthesizers, and we not, we did not talk about live music at all at the beginning. I think. That's what, something that is really missing. We talk about co collaborative, that is really interesting, but there's no real platforms about, um, the, it's beginning to be, of course, but about live interactions on the web. So you can make your own nodes. I won't go back to Faust. You've heard a lot of Faust today and how Faust can make, you can make uh, your own um, uh, GSP objects on the web with Faust Web Audio ASM, for example. You have uh, directly uh, operational HTML SVG interface and you can play your DSP or you can add the DSP only with stop false to ASMGS. Um, here I give a slight, uh, just a tiny example which is not musical at all. Sorry again, it's just noise. You just have, uh, you can, I get noise from the library. It's interesting to see so how you declare a graphical user interface in the, directly in Faust and then I'm compiling it to ASMGS in JavaScript. I have an object here that when I click Normally, I get some sound. No? Okay, doesn't work. I don't know why. Maybe I've, well, it's not the, the point. And we made a web hapsi code uh, on the web. I don't think I have time for a demo, so I, I will quickly conclude about that and where the problems are. But we were, it was based on the Faust SDK made by Romain Michon, the previous work about Julie Smith and uh, several people. And it was interesting for us to ask ourselves, is it possible to have really some demanding uh, processing uh, on the web? Physical modeling is kind of uh, really demanding. And uh, I tried to play with new technologies, with web components uh, of right. It was in beta version, so we, we had several problems uh, with uh, the current limits. So just Web Audio API has a problem with denormalization, which is not made at all by the Web Audio API. We, ha we had to handle it ourselves. So you just play one note and there's silence and then you're stuck at 100% CPU. So we had uh, to deal with very small numbers. And uh, uh, Victor Lazarini talked about a lot about browser implementation pro problems of native uh, web audio API nodes. Uh, you don't get the same spectrum uh, if you uh, implement uh, the same uh, synthesizers where it's a, a, a browser Chrome or uh, Firefox, which is kind of a problem. And uh, I worked with web components, which I think is really, really an interesting way to, 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 to code and to make it available to uh, programmers, but to users too, because you encapsulate everything in an HTML tag. So all your CSS, your JavaScript, it's, nothing is leaking. And it, well, I think it's pretty interesting, but it's not working in every environment. And we have to use polyfills. I just let you imagine how uh, uh, the amount of JavaScript used just to make your browser understand that. And that's where we had huge problem under Firefox. We had things were working pretty well with the same GS, which is developed by Mozilla. So we had good sound, but web components were not there. So we used the polyfill. So we had a huge, huge, huge latent latency. If I just load the page, it would take a tremendous time to, to load. And if I hit note, you will have to wait three seconds to have a sound. On Chrome, you don't have that problem. It's reacting directly, but ASMGS is not well. Well, it's not working the same, in the same way, and we have a lot of artifacts glitches, and it's not great at all. And moreover, with polyfills, uh, we have to use polyfills too to have media API in Firefox, and there were some confl conflicts with web components, web media API, everything was not working so well. It's kind of tricky, but things have evolved. It was uh, the version 0.5 of Polymer, and uh, they are now at version 1, so I think everything is more stable now, and I have to try new things with that. But I think there's a lot of perspective to talk about that, but uh, I, really, uh, I really hope things about uh, WebAssembly that I think could lead to new things. Uh, ASMGS is developed by Mozilla. Like we said, maybe there's some problems of implementation. Everyone seems to be working on WebAssembly, and... Uh, it could be great to have some bytecode on the web and to use music maybe in a more efficient way uh, again. And, well, there's a lot of projects. I encourage you to, to, to look at the uh, ubiquitous, um, 
ubiquitous sorry, music consumption, uh, uh, really trying to, to think of those ways to make uh, ubiquitous music and have new interfaces, new ways of coding and making uh, music available on the web, collaborative music, etc. Et you have Fost Playground that we've seen, Ear Sketch, Musical, etc. But I, where I would like um, to go is really to have um, an um, really real-time environment on the web for people to try to experiment new materials to play with their instruments and not having all the always specific problems etc etc but well that's why I, I have to try there are some thanks and well thank you at all uh, if you have questions Of course, you made us all curious about the Hapsichord, but uh, <laughs> maybe first some questions. <laughs> case, but uh, maybe just one minute for the Apsicord. I, uh, I don't know why I did not have it's sound, so it's not, we don't have a great resolution, but I would try to. Maybe Philip can help with that. Uh, oops, sorry. Maybe I know where, where it's going wrong. <laughs> Maybe I, oh, I know. Oh, pff, sorry. I think I know what's going on. Maybe if I just try to, no. Normally I don't have problem. Yeah. So for example, here, if I, hello, put the hopsicord, I show you, I'm just loading the page, all right? So yeah. It's a better version where well, the things we are talking about, but here just loading, right? And then you have the polyfills that are coming, and it's pretty long. If I go back to uh, the Chrome version, I just click on it, and you have it, right? And if you want to go to other pages, well, it's not, it's kind of fluid. You don't have problems with that. And if I go back to Firefox, well, it's not. I see. Sometimes it has to think about, and if I I try to be really noisy when I hit the key, All right? Just thanks to the polyfills, just can't play in, in the graphical user interface. If I'm going under Chrome, oh, some glitch, and then it's right. But if I try to, you see. We have problems, it's beginning to be really glitchy and we, we don't want that at all. But here, if I'm playing it, it takes time, but it's more st stable, all right? And if I want to tweak to play the plex, the plectrum, for example, in the middle of the chord of the string, well, you can, you can have um, changing uh, to microtonal way of playing, you can change a lot of things and even chords if you are, all those three chords are playing together. And uh, we, uh, of course, work with um, the reasoning. <laughs> sure, oh, I'm gonna put something else. You can change to piano. Uh, you see, the resonator is different. Here you're having um, a, grand, a gong. Or just a reverberation, etc. You you can tweak few things, and well, we are, I still have some work to do with that. It's a first implementation of Faust, but you you get uh, physical modeling of Hapsichord, and you you reconnect the sound. It's not that great. Uh, there there are improvements that I have put back in JavaScript, but well, I want to go further with that and with a polymer and everything. So it is. Thanks a lot. Thanks. Thank you. Thank you.